All right, well, welcome everybody. Welcome to the Washington County Heritage Center. We are so glad that you are here to come learn how to be a gangster. That's what we talked about, right? <laughs> Minority too. Fair, fair. We have a lot to learn from the gangsters in the crowd, especially the ones back there. <laughs> so we are so glad that you guys are here. Uh, my name is Emily Kropchewski. I'm the site manager of the Heritage Center. If you've not been out to visit us, why not? <laughs> I'm just kidding. Uh, we are open Tuesday through Saturday from 10 a.m. to 4 p.m. You're welcome to come by, check it all out. We also have the Warden's House uh, that is open as well. We are redoing the front porch. Don't be concerned. It will all get done someday. And uh, we are still continuing tours. Uh, those are Thursdays through Sundays from uh, 1 o'clock to 4 o'clock. And um, Heidi, Heinz is back there. Wait um, she is our site manager. This is her first season. And we already threw a giant construction project at her. <laughs> so give her a hug when you go by. Um, we're very much looking forward to finishing that project and continuing on with tours um, in the interim. We also have Hay Lake School up in Scandia, and that is open Friday through Sunday. If you've not been there, it is worth the truck up. But for tonight, we have the illustrious <laughs> Sarah, uh, Sarah Hansen. She is from the White Bear Lake Area Historical Society. They have tons of exciting, wonderful things going on there. They just acquired a new building and um, have lots of fun things coming up. If you haven't been to the Philip Brown House, they also have several openings, um, open houses there as well. It's right along the water in White Bear Lake, and it is absolutely gorgeous inside. And um, tonight, of course, she's going to be telling us all about the history of notorious gangsters in the St. Croix Valley and White Bear Lake area. So without further ado, give her a nice warm welcome. <laughs> Just to clarify, it's not a tutorial. Um, so, and, and not a recommendation either, although they seem to have a pretty good time. But as we get toward the end of the program, you'll, you'll hear about all of the, the various forms of demise, so it's it's really not a recommendation. But anyway, um, so as an historian, uh, the gangsters are a challenging topic, or have been a challenging topic for me over the years, mainly from the standpoint that um, when I first started with the White Bear Historical Society, it was uh, 2001, and there were lots of requests for gangster programs, gangster events, gangster everything, tours, whatever. And we knew there were stories, lots of stories, but as you can imagine, gangsters, by the nature of who they are and, and what they were doing, they didn't want to leave a lot of records. They didn't leave receipts. They didn't leave photos. They didn't leave maps or, you know, details. <laughs> Those are the kind of things we like. So it's a hard, it's hard from that standpoint um, to be able to document their activities. But a couple of things changed about 15 years ago. They started to, uh, the, the FBI actually started to digitize a lot of their records and put them out online. So if you don't get enough gangster information tonight, the um, you can actually go to, I think it's called the vault.gov or vault.com <laughs> or something like that. Uh, you can Google it, you'll, you'll find it. But uh, there are all sorts of documents, scan, fingerprint cards, um, arrest records, all sorts of things, transcripts and other things. So that's a huge, huge resource. The other thing that's interesting um, that's come out in the last decade or so um, are very similarly are the records from the, the Bureau of Criminal Apprehension here in Minnesota through the state. So the Minnesota Historical Society has put those out on their website and again just a huge element of, of information, huge pile of information. Um, but the caveat with that is that those things come from a very specific background, very specific bias law enforcement. Everything that's in those records, you know, is, is because they think the gangsters are bad, the gangsters are awful, blah, 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 um, and are criminals, which they were. Um, but, of course, that's the mindset that, we, that those items were written with and recorded with. Uh, so it's hard to get sort of an unbiased viewpoint. Um, one of the treasures that we have is, uh, for particularly for us in this area, is that um, one of our most notorious gangsters was Elvin Creepy Carpus. And Carpus was one who actually was arrested, taken alive, one of the very few who were taken alive as time went on, and ultimately lived out his entire sentence. He ended up being sentenced and, and um, transferred to Alcatraz, lived out his entire sentence at Alcatraz and was paroled and brought, um, moved, because he was born in Canada, so he was kicked back to Canada when he got out. <laughs> but um, he told his story to anyone who would listen he would he did you know documentaries he wrote a book he did all of it and so we have his version of it 
which again has a certain viewpoint because he was the last man standing. So I'll share some of those stories as we go. But um, ultimately, it, it, it helped sort of weave some of that together. And then beyond that, um, just logic comes into play, frankly. Uh, and you'll hear that is particularly when I talk about Dillinger, for example, um, he gets credited with an awful lot of information and a lot of activities that he couldn't possibly have done. And they'll talk about how we kind of play through some of those. So, and then the other element that we use or the other piece that we use to bring these stories together are frankly that stories. And so this is, we call this part one. I think we're, we have like 20 different parts by this point or 20 different focuses, but um, we have this one and then we have part two, which is sort of a sequel where we just keep adding more because every time we do a program like this, we get a story, a new story from somebody where we can go sort of pull up that thread and say, hey, did they really rent this cottage or were they really out in this space? Um, interestingly, this this topic has, has legs. It goes all over the place this morning. Um, we were out at uh, Presbyterian Homes in Bloomington doing a very similar program, uh, a little more generalized because of the uh, non-localness. But um, ultimately, I had a gentleman come up to me whose father was a, a treasury agent in the 1930s. So he was dealing with prohibition and dealing with all of those things. And he had some great stories to share, not specifically white bear, but just kind of a, a little more background or a little more um, element to why these were, um, you know, well, how things went, I guess, if you will. So with that, we'll go ahead and jump into some of these, these images and um, stories. Uh, and I bring up the treasury piece, uh, particularly that was important mainly because um, the gangster era goes hand in hand with prohibition. There's no, there's no gangster um, surge, if you will, without prohibition and, and you can debate that all directions, but um, they were doing, the gangsters were involved in lots of other things, uh, gambling, prostitution, kidnapping eventually, all sorts of things, bank robbing and whatnot, but bootlegging is really what gave them their power. That's what that's what they were able to do to bring in more money than you can imagine. And so ultimately, when Prohibition went in, kind of play it all through, I'll give you a quick little background of that. But when Prohibition was approved in 1919, in January of 1919, um, it was it was approved in a way that it didn't go into effect until January of 1920. Okay, so a full year later, you had warning, if you will. The next element of it is that. The way the law was written, number one, it was hard to actually enforce, which is a whole other element. Um, but the way the law was written, you could consume alcohol if you had it. You couldn't sell it, you couldn't distribute it, you couldn't make it, you couldn't, you know, all those things, you couldn't transfer it, whatever. But if you had it, you could drink it legally, there was no issue. So of course they gave you 12 months to go out and stock up. <laughs> and most people who wanted alcohol, who were going to want alcohol during that time, really didn't believe that prohibition was going to last. I mean, it was known as the noble experiment. And from the beginning, it was considered that there's no way it was going to make it all the way through or we may be that way forever. So people assumed that, you know, a couple of years and we'll be done with this. It took a lot longer than that, frankly. Um, it took 13 years because it wasn't until uh, March of 1933 that it was actually repealed. And then that didn't go fully into effect until 34. So if you can imagine, even, even those best of orders when it comes to fear or spirits or whatever, um, didn't have enough stockpiled for 13 years. So, uh, <laughs> so by the mid 1920s, things were getting a little sketchy. And that's really when the gangsters started to come into play heavily. Uh, it was it was all over the Midwest. It was a big deal, particularly across the Midwest. Chicago and Kansas City and St. Paul were sort of the key spots, if you will. And ultimately, um, just a couple of interesting statistics that always make me sort of stunned. Uh, according to the, the Bureau of Investigation, which was the predecessor to the FBI, uh, in 19, by the mid-1920s, there were 1,300 individual gangs in Chicago alone, in the Chicago area. Not gangsters, but individual affiliated gangs. Uh, and in 19, by 1926 or in 1926, they were averaging uh, 12,000 murders across the country per year. So that that is a, that was a huge leap in mean, the violence. The level of violence went up drastically. Um, and like I said, most pretty much everybody, most scholars who've studied this type of thing uh, agree that the gangsters wouldn't have had the authority, if you will, or the power that they did without prohibition. So 
with all of that said, um, and, and the opportunities that Prohibition provided, we have, this is one of my favorite artifacts that we have. It's a prescription, literally a prescription. And it's actually from the, um, uh, it's, I tie this back to the Treasury Department because it was actually the US Treasury Department who was responsible for prohibition and for, for monitoring or uh, regulating alcohol. So all prescriptions, all, um, all records, if you will, all inventories and things, you can actually see where it says U.S. Treasury Department on the side there. Um, it, all of those records had to be controlled by, by the U.S. government. This is actually a prescription for whiskey. Not so hard to accomplish today. Um, not something you need to go see the doctor for. A uh, little bit hard to read, but it, it says um, kind of liquor right up there. So I'm not even trying to deal with drugs of any kind. Kind of liquor. Uh, whiskey, one quart. Uh, and I believe we've determined, like most doctors, the, the handwriting is a little challenging to read. Uh, but I believe we've determined that it says three ounces uh, taken after meals or after, after meals. Um, <laughs> great. Um, so I, we love this for a number of reasons, but the primary one being that it's actually a prescription written out to John Johnson. So for those who are sailors or boat fanatics, um, John Johnson was the founder of the Johnson Boat Works in White Bear. And you'll hear a little bit about his neighborhood later. Um, but it was written out to John Johnson. Uh, it was written by Dr. Al Voges. You see a little bit further down where it says duplicate. And then it was filled by Clarence Swearens. All three of these men are like staples in the White Bear community during this time. This was not, an, and it may have very, legitimately been for a sinus infection or whatever. Um, I don't know that it wasn't a legitimate prescription by any means, because of course they didn't have antibiotics, they didn't have the things we have today. But um, it's an entertaining piece because the whole idea of prohibition and bootlegging and, and all of that, um, sort of skirting through the laws in that regard, weren't the, it was considered basically a victimless crime. People were not, it was not just the underworld doing this. It was the average citizen who was interested in having alcohol and um, having you know, a party or whatever. And so ultimately, um, really, the only way that you could do that legally was through a prescription, a medical prescription. And I have to say that my great grandfather was a doctor in St. Paul during this time period. And we have his log books that he had to, he had to keep a copy of it. And then they sent in, you know, whatever to the, the feds. Um, but people from all over the Midwest are showing up in St. Paul to get prescriptions for rhinitis, rhinitis or whatever, you know, sinus infections, sinusitis, um, all sorts of other things. Um, and it's always, I mean, the, the books are just filled whiskey, 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 whiskey. Like, wow, that's rough. Um, but so kind of an entertaining piece. The only other way to legally acquire alcohol during this time is for clergy. So if you were a priest or a minister and needed it for sacred sacramental purposes, you could purchase wine. Uh, people ask, was there a surge in people joining, men joining the priesthood or the clergy? There was. <laughs> and I, I actually haven't ever looked to see if that then dropped off and the, the census sort of changes afterwards or not, but um, it's kind of an interesting piece. So uh, in addition to trying to find it legally, the um, others who had it or had it basically by, by the mid 1920s, people were determined that um, essentially it kind of it essentially law enforcement really came down to the fact that if you had alcohol by you know, 1925, 26, you probably acquired it somehow. I mean, you probably didn't have it from 1920 or 1919. And so, um, they started to really go after folks and raid houses and raid farms and try to find the stills and all of that. Uh, so a lot of people during that time period had spaces within their homes that were hidden, uh, whether they hid the alcohol in it or they allowed it as a way to sort of escape or whatever. So this is actually a picture of an escape hatch, if you will. It's, it's filled in with ductwork and pipes and things for the family's pool in their backyard now. But this house is actually in Delwood, so not far from here. Um, and uh, the family had, I love this because they had this whole beautiful room downstairs with a built-in bar with the cabinet and doors that open in the, in the bar area um, and beautiful space down there, the bathroom eventually. And, and then this escape hatch, which is staged with bottles and things. Those aren't 
from you know a century ago. But um, the family who built the house loves to say, and, and I, I get exactly what they're saying, but it makes me kind of smile. So they'll say, you know, it wasn't a speakeasy. This is what we would refer to as a private speakeasy in your own home. It's a place where you can go drink and you've got a decent chance of escaping and getting out. And the, the family says, it wasn't, a, it's not a speakeasy. That's not how it was built. It was, it's just a party room. What's the difference? <laughs> uh, but they had the escape hatch, number one, if you will. And then they also had um, the part that makes me kind of go, hmm, uh, is that in the foyer of the house, to get to this space, there's no interior way to get to this basement, to get to this lower level party room, other, other than the escape hatch. Um, but other than a paneled curved door that's concealed within the oval shaped foyer, in the house. So when you walk in the, the first, the foyer, before you go into the main portion of the house, you have to know where to push the button on the door to get it to pop open to see it. Um, and then you go down those curved stairs and, and you're in the speakeasy. So it, it was definitely not something they were showing off, if you will. But it was very, very common. This house was built in the early 1920s. Uh, and folks, it's, a, it's on Echo Street, actually, in Delwood. If anybody's familiar with it, there are a few bigger, older houses built along there. And essentially, people claimed during that time period that um, those houses, those families that basically put the Wiper Yacht Club out of business because the Yacht Club couldn't legally sell alcohol. So nobody was going there for dinner or whatever. Um, and they were just going to the parties instead. So you never know. Um, excuse me. The, uh, this one is another, a little bit different type of speakeasy. This is a house today, and, and it really mostly has been a house all the way through, but it's more, it's a little bit more public. This is one of those places where you could go, you didn't have to be invited to a party or an outing or whatever, but it was, it's a house on Warner Road, Montemita, and it um, was called the Silver Slipper or the King's Horses at different times. And ultimately, they would have card games going on and, and whatever in the house. Uh, and one of my favorite stories with this one actually is that, um, that do, so during during its era as the King's Forces, it was owned by a man named Al Connolly, uh, who lived there and then ran the, the business and, and then had the bar upstairs and kind of a share of the bar in the in the house and a kind of a shady reputation or a reputation for shady characters from St. Paul and Chicago. Um, and uh, ultimately, what I find entertaining is that we have a number of, of fellows who grew up in Matabidi during this time period and who are older gentlemen now who talk about the fact that they could never figure it out because their mothers always, if they were walking into town to go to the store or whatever, always told them they shouldn't walk down Warner. They shouldn't go past this house. And they, that's the big deal, you know? Um, and ultimately, once eventually, once they became adults, their, um, the families confided in them and said, well, you know, th there was a habit of having dancing girls come out the side door downstairs. We didn't want them to be walking by if that happened. Uh, lots of people like to share lots of stories, so we don't know if that's actually true or not, but um, kind of an interesting one. You never know. Uh, this is another building actually right on Montemini Avenue in, in Montemini, right across, right near the Montemini District Center. So if you're familiar with where that is, it's known as the Brand Horse Building. It has some apartments and things in it now. But at one point during Prohibition, the lower, the first level was a tea room, and it was called Polly's Kettle. And they had, it's, it's always been said that if we knew whatever the, the order was, sort of like going to Starbucks now or that sort of thing, you know, with your, well, I don't even know, um, dairy free frap, blah, blah, blah. If you ordered properly, you'd get something in your, in your tea that probably wasn't milk. Uh, <laughs> again, we can't prove that. I can't say for certain, but there are enough people from different uh, elements that have come forward and, and said that. So you never know what's happening. And and again, people weren't, this wasn't necessarily considered to be a horrible thing. It wasn't like people were looking at their neighbors as, as awful, um, awful criminals and that type of thing. <clears throat> so this is one of our favorites. And, and this is one of those stories that um, we're still playing with a bit. But you can see the Juniper Street Salon on the side there um, at Juniper and Matamida. That property is actually for sale right now. So if anybody's interested, um, as I understand <laughs> it, it's for sale. But at one point, it was the, the home of Buenera's uh, lunchroom, as you can see, and, and we love this um, menu. You can see all the wonderful phrases. Uh, you know, a three-decker sandwich is 25 cents. Um, 
coffee is five cents. Uh, I think the only place you can find it for that now is Wall Drug, but uh, and, and ultimately, um, but the second cup of coffee is free with all lunch orders of 25 cents or more. So apparently you got that too. Anyway, uh, one of my favorite things, and, and they don't actually, this must have been the lunch menu and, and breakfast menu, uh, not the dinner menu, but ultimately, um, Guanera's in later years, uh, they were was referred to as Guanera's Spaghetti Shack. And ultimately they had, um, an advertising campaign at one point that uh, Babyface Nelson and Dillinger absolutely loved their spaghetti sauce at Guanera's. Well, when you come to find out that Babyface Nelson and Dillinger were gone by 1934 or so, and the gentleman who uh, ran Guanera's would only have been like 18 years old, her own Guanera's would have only been like 18 years old at that point. The math doesn't quite compute and the, the restaurant's era doesn't quite match up, um, but it was certainly a good marketing one. Because a lot of people still come to us and say, you know, I've had the same spaghetti as Dillinger. <laughs> Maybe. Uh, you never know. But uh, this is a picture of Willerney, actually. And the picture was taken because of the road being flooded out, you can see. But actually, the purpose for us, so this is 244, runs back along there. If you're familiar at all with the Willerney Post Office, um, <laughs> it would be right about here. The picture would be taken from about that spot. Uh, but we're looking at the building um, uh, up, in, up in the, about almost the center, uh, up at the top there. And you can see the post coming down. And then that was actually a, a service station or garage for automobiles. And ultimately, that big front window, you can't quite see it. It's just around the corner. But ultimately, that big front window that's there now, or that was there, um, was shot out one night in the early 1930s. And it was reported, you know, gangster activity in the area and gunfight and all of this stuff. This is the building now is Gordy's Steakhouse, so people are familiar with that. Um, and it's, it's kind of a fun to be able to look at that sort of entrance area. But <clears throat> I laughed because we, you know, it was one of those things that's reported in the newspaper and they never caught anybody. They never had witnesses or whatever for that window being broken. And ultimately, I had a gentleman come to me about 10 years ago and said, after one of these programs, and said, um, <laughs> Jump too far ahead. Uh, anyway, it said uh, that was me and my buddies. We were goofing around and broke the window. Um, and you know, everything I'm like, so it was fine. So, again, there are some of those stories that are out there, but uh, kind of an interesting time for sure. So, ultimately, as we get into the notorious gangsters themselves, here you see uh, probably the most notorious of all Al Capone. Uh, Capone was was something for sure. Uh, <laughs> he was he was a lot of things. He was born in New York uh, and moved to Chicago. Chicago as a young man, he he pretty quickly rose to power as the leader of the Capones, the the most significant, if you will, uh, bootlegging syndicates in the Midwest. Um, he also, in addition to bootlegging, he specialized, if you want to call it that in uh, gambling and prostitution. He had no qualms. Each of the different gangs kind of had their own areas of expertise. You know? <laughs> um, but uh, he, he really, those were kind of his three things. Um, and of course, many of you have probably heard that by 1931 or in 1931, he was indicted for tax evasion. That was the, the charge they could make stick. They, they knew he had done lots of other things, much probably worse things, but tax evasion was what they could actually get him on. Uh, and so in the summer of 1934, he was transferred to Alcatraz. He'd been in prison prior to that, but transferred to Alcatraz basically to cut off all of his communication because even from prison here um, in the States or in the on the mainland, if you will, he was able to continue some of his efforts or some of his um, world, if you will. And so ultimately, uh, that was what they, most of the big names, most of the most powerful were eventually transferred to Alcatraz because being on an island out in the San Francisco Bay, they were more remote, if you will, than they were. It was amazing how well they could communicate through newspapers, through passing messages and weird things uh, as time went on. But now we know that uh, Capone spent a ton of time in Chicago, sometime in Northwestern Wisconsin, for sure. There are reports that he was out in this area. We can't say for certain, we can't pin him down. 
Uh, I don't, if he was here, I would never say never, but if he was here, I wouldn't, and he wasn't here often. This was not his, this was sort of enemy territory, if you will, of, of all of his area. And so ultimately um, he may have been here. And I, I think that if he was, it was probably more early on in his career, if you will. Uh, <laughs> but he uh, definitely spent time certainly in, in the nearby vicinity. Um, but his biggest rival was a gentleman named Bugs Moran. And there's a gentleman in the room wearing a Piccadilly shirt, which which makes me smile because for anyone who's familiar with the Piccadilly over the years, Bugs Moran had nothing to do with it. But uh, for anyone who's familiar with the Piccadilly over the years uh, and know, knew Tommy Stanek, the man who owned the Piccadilly for many, many years, um, this picture reminds me of Tom. And, and Tom was my uncle, so I can say that. Um, I told his children that. But I just the way he's sort of leaning against the bar and kind of that jovial smile, it, it reminds me of him. And so, and that's really what people said about Bugs Moran. So Bugs was the, the Capone of St. Paul, if you will. He was in charge of all the big uh, projects, if you will, around here. And so ultimately, it's kind of entertaining because he had, he was almost like of two worlds. He had this wonderful reputation for being this really nice guy. He was a, an alum of Cretan, a good Catholic boy. Um, in fact, he said that his Catholic morals were the reason that he could never uh, engage in prostitution in his business endeavors. Um, but before you get too impressed, uh, he is also <laughs> known as, so Bugs is his nickname, and in, in, in gangster slang, he was named that because um, it means that he's absolutely crazy. He's buggy. Uh, <laughs> and he is known to be the father of the drive-by shooting. He was the one who came up with the idea of you know, just going by and peppering your enemy with, with gunfire. So, not the innocent little ultra boy that he wants people to think he was. Uh, no. So, but he was definitely around. In fact, there are some accusations that fly uh, through the years that he was trying to headquarter out here for a while and, and other things. But um, we can't. He was. He definitely came out around the, the lake and the river and. and Got a kid out for a while or took his time visiting for sure. Um, so we have John Dillinger, kind of our big three, if you will. Uh, but John Dillinger, who um, was a character in his own right, he was born and raised in Indiana. Uh, so again, that Midwestern element to things. Um, he had a, a classically challenged childhood. His mother died when he was young. His father was not a great role model. Um, and Dillinger attempted robbery, he attempted to rob a grocery store with one of his good friends when he was about 20, 21. And ultimately, they got caught, um, but ultimately Dillinger confessed and said he's going to serve his time and do his thing. Uh, his friend fought it, fought the charges and served two years. Dillinger was sentenced for 14 years mm -hmm. and served nine of them. So he, he, vowed when he got out of prison that he would never confess to anything again, because obviously that didn't work out so well for him. But the other interesting element of that is that Dillinger was paroled in May of 1933. He was famously gunned down in July of 1934. So he spent most of his adult life in prison. They knew exactly where he was and what was going on. So ultimately, um, Dillinger by far is the one who's credited with the majority of the activities around our area. Um, and there is essentially no possible physical way he could do all the things that he gets credit for doing. Um, just from the standpoint of there were only 15 months or so in there that he could have done it. Uh, so it's kind of an intriguing thing. He certainly um, was the leader of a gang of quite a few men. So the Dillinger gang gets credit for a lot of things and that's probably accurate. But I think the other piece that comes into play there is the, the kind of mindset that um, all the gangsters sort of get lumped together. And so ultimately, the um, any of the, the men in their 20s or 30s kind of become Dillinger to us. Any of the women involved in the gang activities sort of become Mob Barker, if you will, and, and they just kind of get lumped together. So there were, there were hundreds, if not thousands, of lower level, mid or lower level gangsters around the Midwest, um, certainly thousands. And uh, Dillinger gets a heck of a lot of credit for the different things they were doing, let's put it that way. We um, ultimately, uh, and again, Dillinger is one of those who is said to um, 
have, you know, been around Matamina, I find grove trees and doing different things. And of course, eating Equineras. Uh, so <laughs> you never know. Um, anyway, so one of the reasons that this area, kind of St. Paul and its extremities, if you will, uh, it got so popular with the gangsters is, is this gentleman, uh, John O'Connor, who was police chief in St. Paul, police chief. He predated the gangster era, if you will, predated the Prohibition era. Um, but he laid the groundwork for what allowed them or drew people, the, the criminal element, to this vicinity anyway. Uh, as you can see, he had, a, he had a, an agreement or he had a plan or a process called the layover agreement that really, um, in his day, really started with they had to check in. They had to let the police department know they were here. So if you were a known criminal and you got caught without sort of checking in, you'd be in trouble. But um, if you came and told them, yep, I'm in town for the next week, we'll be here, whatever. Um, and then uh, agreed that you would, you promised that you would not commit any crimes within the city limits while you were here. <clears throat> um, now, that didn't mean that you couldn't go over to West St. Paul or South St. Paul or Minneapolis or wherever and come running back safely, which of course made them really happy uh, with O'Connor. But um, that worked. This is actually a an official program, an official thing in the city of St. Paul. I mean, this was in their annual reports. O'Connor um, bragged about his reduction in crime because of this agreement. Um, he got all the, the criminals to behave. And so he was very proud of that. As you can imagine, as prohibition kicked in and, and people started to get a little wilder, uh, things started to shift. And so, especially with money floating around quite heavily, it, the whole process started to evolve, and of course, corruption started to play a part in this. And so, in addition to coming and checking in, the criminals had to leave a little host gift to the, the police department. Um, and of course, you know, no crimes, blah blah blah. They also were able to then typically be tipped off if anybody was on to them, or, or you know, any of the federal agents were coming to raid or do anything. Um, usually they got a warrant. So uh, it shifted from its initial intent for sure um, as time went on, but not quite what they had planned on. So um, oh, before I forget, uh, before I jump jump into baby face, uh, so as I said, the O'Connor system was really the piece. Now for us out here, they'd be in St. Paul, they'd be in the vicinity, they were, the vicinity, they were already here, but if they really wanted to lay low, they'd come out sort of those recreation areas, those vacation areas, and so it would draw them out. Um, and one of my favorite uh, headlines is, uh, in April of 1933, the Minneapolis newspaper, one of the Minneapolis newspapers, was running a headline that declared White Bear as a crime resort. Mm -hmm. uh, and the following, the, the article actually read, discovery that the automobile used in the holdup of the North American bank was stolen at White Bear need astonish no one. The trail of crooks who participate in major Twin Cities crimes seem to lead almost inevitably to the celebrated summer resort section of Ramsey County, which has been the habitat of the underworld's big shots of recent years. When Bugs Moran came to Minnesota to lay plans for taking over the racketeering in the Twin Cities, he held his conferences with the local nabobs of his trade at White Bear. When bubbling over Devers, notorious bank robber and jailbird, now vacationing in Leavenworth, was operating in Minnesota, he held forth as a gentleman of leisure, <laughs> White Bear. It's time to clean up White Bear. So ultimately, <laughs> the White Bear Press, who we love, um, says they printed a rebuttal the next week that essentially said, uh uh, <laughs> all that happens on the Washington County side of the lake. <laughs> so, sorry. <laughs> uh, <laughs> I will say that, and you'll hear a little bit about it, but I will say that the majority of the stuff that we actually have evidence of did happen on the Washington County side of the lake, but Super. You never, there's still some, there's some planning that went out of Ramsey County for sure. But um, anyway, the, the press claimed that White Bear enjoys the reputation of being the cleanest of any city in the state. White Bear has never had a murder. White Bear has never been the scene of street holdup, nor has any of its women or girls ever been attacked in any part of the city at any time of day or night and ladies and other citizens go anywhere in all parts of the city at any hour of the night in perfect safety. No bandit or hard character ever was known to hold forth out here. <laughs> That's a little rough, but uh, we certainly had, had them, and then again, all over around the lake and, and the whole vicinity. 
Uh, but ultimately, here you see uh, Babyface Nelson. He's one of my favorites, mainly for his nickname, because he was about five feet, four inches tall and 130, 35 pounds, mostly. And um, as you can see, he died as a fairly young man, but he still looks like he's maybe 15 uh, in that picture. <laughs> and this is three years before he passed away. Um, so he was actually, his first arrest happened when he was 14 years old. Not that one, that was 1931, but um, 14 years old for auto theft. And a long history of arrests began, and this is a pretty typical story of all of these guys. Uh, but by 1931, he was um, sentenced to a prison term of one year to life, which he was serving in the Illinois State Penitentiary at Joliet. After his year in prison, uh, he was being returned to the state pen following a court appearance when he managed to escape from the guards. Uh, he then fled to California where his wife, Helen, joined him. They stayed there for more than a year before venturing to Indiana where they met Homer Van Meter and connected with the Dillinger game um, for the first time. In April of 1934, Babyface, uh, Helen, and their buddy, John Paul Chase, went to Chicago and joined the Dillinger gang officially. They even vacationed together at Little Bohemia in northern Wisconsin, which many of you probably heard about. Uh, during a raid there, Babyface escaped, but the women were left behind. Mm. Nice. Uh, <laughs> Nelson shot three special agents while trying to escape from a house where he had taken hostages to hide out. His wife, who had been captured, was paroled and met up with Nelson and Chase about a month later. And again, that's one of those stories where they were able to communicate through ads in the newspapers and different things, I and mean, they couldn't just call somebody and say, hey, you know, my wife is hiding out or whatever. I need to find her. Um, interestingly, when Babyface showed up at the uh, post office at Spink's grocery store in Matamina to pick up his mail under an alias, of course, uh, Mr. Spink mistook him as a gentleman tutor for a family of some well-to-do summer folks who were at the lake. So um, he certainly was able to look the, the decent part, not the criminal part. He was actually killed or eventually killed in a shootout in November of 1934. And you'll see that most of these folks did find their end at 33, 34, or early 35 as we go. Uh, here we have Frank Jelly Nash. I have no idea why his name Jelly, his nickname was Jelly. Um, that's, there's lots of theories, but never one that's really made a lot of sense. Um, but uh, he's a character. He's been referred to as the most successful bank robber in US history. His criminal record reached back to 1913 uh, when he was sentenced to life at the state pen in McAllister, Oklahoma for murder. He was later pardoned. Uh, in 1920, he was given a 25 year sentence at the same penitentiary for burglary with explosives and later pardoned. <laughs> um, on March 3rd, 1924, Nash began a 25 year sentence at the US penitentiary at Leavenworth uh, for assaulting a male custodian. They weren't letting him off on that one. Uh, he actually escaped uh, in October of 1930. So the FBI launched this huge, or the Bureau of Investigation launched this huge search for him, uh, which extended across the country um, and actually in parts of Canada as well. And during that period, there were constant reports that he was hiding out in White Bear. Whether or not he was, we can't say for sure, but um, he, he's definitely, he had definitely been here at different points. Uh, evidence gathered by the Bureau indicated that Nash had assisted in the escape of seven prisoners from the U.S. Penitentiary at Leavenworth on December 11th, 1931. Um, and the investigation also disclosed Nash's close association with Francis Keating, Thomas Holden, and several other well-known gunmen who had participated in a number of bank robberies throughout the Midwest. So these networks were incredible. Um, they just, and they, of course, kept breaking each other out and, and enabling each other to do all of these things. Um, and there was a, a bit of an honor among thieves, if you will, from the standpoint of uh, they kind of protected each other, or at least tried to <clears throat> more for their own gain, I think, because they needed each other to pull off these operations. But um, Keating and Holden also connect us to Machine Gun Kelly, who you see here. On July 15th, 1930, Keating and Holden showed their gratefulness to Kelly uh, for his help in their escape from Leavenworth by inviting him to participate in robbing the Bank of Wilmer. Uh, included among the bank robbers were Harvey Bailey, Vern Miller, and Sammy Silverman. The bandits escaped with an estimated $70,000, but it was not a clean robbery. The head of Minnesota's Bureau of Criminal Activity, as it was called at the time, claimed, I can't remember a holdup, 
in the history of the state since the raids of the Younger Brothers and the Jesse James gangs, which compares to the one at Wilmer for daring and cold-blooded disregard of human life. During the robbery, a cashier was pistol whipped, and when a group of onlookers formed outside the bank, one of the gunmen unleashed a burst from his Tommy gun into the crowd and wounded two women. Interestingly, that particular robbery kind of shows back up again um, as a, just a less than a month later, um, when on August 14th, 1930, a posse of agents from the BCA, uh, searching for clues to the robbery from Wilmer, pulled up to examine three fresh bodies found near Wildwood Amusement Park. The agents immediately identified one body as that of bank robber Sammy Silverman, a former taxi driver known in Minneapolis as the $10 kid. Uh, the FBI or the Bureau heard from informants that Silverman got away from a Kansas City robbery with all of the money and was supposed to have been slain by members of the Bugs Moran gang. Again, they, they were good unless you crossed them, of course. Uh, killed with Silverman, who was shot in the head and the neck, were Kansas City Hoods Mike Russick and Frank Weenie Coleman. Uh, one variation of the story says the assailants left the three bo bloody bodies hanging from willow trees by Lover's Lane near Wildwood Park. Uh, that is uh, this version. I can clearly say to see that it was um, they were shot, and and uh, there's a lot of speculation over time. There's several different uh, newspaper articles. You can see a couple more, the St. Paul and Minneapolis versions. Um, you can see three gangsters. St. Paul says three gangsters murdered on road near Wildwood. Minneapolis, of course, is three gangsters massacred. Um, they really didn't like white man, uh, <laughs> no matter where you were. Um, so it's kind of interesting. But uh, in, in, in a 1934 prison interview with Detroit, Detroit police, Machine Gun Kelly actually identified a member of the Barker Carpus gang, Vern Miller, who you see here, and this is actually the bank of Wilmer over there as well. Um, Vern Miller as the killer who committed the triple slaying near Wildwood Park. According to Machine Gun Kelly, Miller had robbed the Wilmer Bank with Silverman and the other gangsters. Silverman apparently double-crossed Miller a few weeks later, and when Miller saw him and, and his friends at White Bear at Wildwood Amusement Park, he killed them all. Uh, by the time that this accusation was made, Miller had been killed by someone else, so they couldn't decide if, or they couldn't uh, confirm nor deny if that was actually true or not. But uh, so this, this cycle continued on and on forever, really, basically. Um, so the biggest place, one of, one of our favorite places in town that I wish was still there on the shore of White Bear Lake is the Plantation Nightclub. And ultimately, um, really the plantation, the, the gangsters, when they would come out here, they would come out to the area, they were really laying low. They were hiding out. They weren't looking for entertainment necessarily they weren't looking to cause trouble they were mostly resting they were trying to stay out of the limelight and they were probably planning their next project whatever that might be um the plantation is is sort of the one exception so they would definitely come out uh to the plantation and see um other gangsters if you will that was sort of the headquarters kind of like um, some of the bars and dance clubs and stuff that were in St. Paul where if you wanted to connect and find out who was in town that's exactly where you would go. So the plantation um, was actually built right over here you can see the lake shore this is Kowalski's and Goose Lake down here obviously um, the White Bear BFW is up on the top there and this is White Bear Avenue as it circles around here. Um, so the plantation today is Lions Park in White Bear but uh, the building initially was, the site was initially the um, Ramaley Boatworks. So within this vicinity, there were three different boatworks, the, the um, Ramaley, the Amundsen, which was just to the left of the Ramaley, and then right off the top of the screen, if you will, was where the Johnson Boatworks, you know, our, our whiskey prescription guy. Um, <laughs> uh, so they were all in this little vicinity. Uh, he was close to the gangsters if he needed, you know, any food like liquor, I guess. But uh, they were all in this little vicinity. And ultimately, um, basically, Hermales figured out by the middle of the 1920s that if they, um, you know, there were three boat builders right there on that bay, on that edge of the bay. Uh, if they turned their building into a dance hall and started doing some other things, they might make more money. Uh, so they did, and it went so well that they ended up tearing down that original building and building the one you see here, which is much more elaborate. Uh, it was named the plantation, and inside it had like all sorts of tobacco leaf decor and, and plants and all sorts of things. 
Um, but it really truly served as the local headquarters for the gangsters when they came onto White Bear. Ultimately, uh, in addition to being sort of the connection points, you could show up and find out if so who was in town, what what they were planning, what was going on. If you needed more bodies for a project, um, they you know you could find them there. In later years, as time went on, it also served pretty well as a um, a cover cover story. So one of the things that was known, one of the things that John Johnson, for example, loved to say about the gangsters is we always knew who they were because they were so pale. They never came out during the day. They, they were at the lake, but they never really went out on the water or did <laughs> anything. Um, they stayed in the house and they stayed up all night or out all night, but then they would sleep all day. And so I mean, everybody knew what was going on. But uh, so ultimately the plantation became a great cover because they could say they were musicians. So when they came to rent a cottage or whatever, they had a good reason for being in town for a few weeks and would show up with all their goodies. So the um, our best known gangsters that we can absolutely pinpoint, which is the part I love, of course, from a proof standpoint, uh, is the Barker, uh, Barker boys with their mom, Ma Barker and, and the Barker boys, and then Elvin Purpose. So known typically as either the Bloody Barkers, for obvious reasons, or um, the Barker Purpose gang. Initially, there there were four Barker boys, um, although every now and then things will pop up saying that Ma had more children than that, but we, we, there were four that we're pretty confident on. Uh, Herman, Lloyd, Arthur, and Fred, uh, and ultimately Herman and Lloyd didn't last very long, which sounds really horrible, but um, they met pretty ugly ends pretty quickly. Doc, uh, Arthur, Doc Barker, and Freddie, the baby, were um, with Ma pretty well to the end, so they, they kind of stuck it out, if you will. Um, Arthur, who you see here, or Doc, um, was involved in a series of bank robberies and auto thefts that led to his arrest, several arrests. Uh, it seemed he was generally released after a few months. He Kind of like the others, he'd go in, he'd either be pardoned or paroled, and um, then he'd find his way back in fairly quickly. Uh, interesting, he's, his nickname is Doc, in a sarcastic sort of way, because he was not <laughs> the brightest bulb on the tree. Uh, um, but he ultimately... Poor Doc. Uh, he, he was captured in January of 1935. So, so as the story kind of unfolds as time goes on here, by 1934, when prohibition had been fully repealed and people could get alcohol legally and the, the power, if you will, of the uh, gangsters was starting to fade, they couldn't make as much money. They were getting a little more desperate doing other things. And many, many of the gangsters, the higher level gangsters were either killed by each other, as you've been hearing, um, or were killed in shootouts as they were being captured. Uh, very few of them, with one major exception I'll share in a minute, uh, were taken alive. So um, we'll get to it in a minute. Uh, but ultimately, most of them um, didn't last past 1934. So January of 1935, the Barkers are doing okay. They're still there. Uh, and ultimately, Doc gets captured. And in his pocket... He actually gets captured and is convicted of a, a kid, one of the kidnappings that they did. Uh, and in his pocket, he has the address and a map to the hideout in Florida where Ma and Freddie are staying. <laughs> Whoops. Yeah. Uh, not good. Um, ultimately, he ended up, he made it to 1939 because he went to prison. He ended up being uh, sent to Alcatraz and he tried to escape and was fatally shot. So he, he did last longer. He ultimately was taken alive. But um, his brilliance... Uh, actually led to the demise of his brother and his mother because the feds used that map and went and found the house where they were in Florida. And Freddie, who was the baby and very protective of his mother, um, came out shooting. And it, that was his reaction. And so, of course, they returned fire and, and was um, he was ultimately killed. And Ma was as well through the shootout. Ma is a whole study all on her own. Um, she... It's interesting because she was ultimately made out to be sort of the mastermind and the, and the horrible um, leader of the gang, if you will. But uh, realistically, pretty much, well, at Carpus for sure, who you'll hear from in a moment, but Carpus, um, so there's no way Ma was not. In fact, I think his exact quote was Ma couldn't plan lunch. <laughs> <laughs> So she was definitely not the leader of the crew, but um, but she was fabulous cover. So if you go to, you know, not go somewhere in a smaller town or whatever, and you want to rent a cottage for a month, 
uh, it's much easier to get to rent to a middle-aged woman and her grown sons than it is to rent to a bunch of guys. You know, just people are getting a little bit leery, a little bit more wary. Um, ultimately, that that was really her sole purpose uh, for the most part. She was a challenged mother um, in many ways. <laughs> you can probably tell by the way the four boys ended up in some parts. But um, in fact, sheriffs across the country when the kids were little talked about, I think they grew up in Tulsa, Oklahoma, and the sheriff down there said that um, every time he'd bring in one of the Barker, or one of the, yeah, one of the Barker boys, uh, Ma would come in screaming and wouldn't stop yelling at him until he released them, and he finally just would give up and send them home <laughs> because it was just easier. He would not stop, um, which of course is a lovely behavior to reinforce, but a uh, <laughs> whole other level of, of whatever with her. Uh, but Interestingly, uh, Elvin Creepy Carpus, like I said before, is um, the one who lived. He was he was the federal public enemy number four, number one. He was the fourth public enemy number one, and he lived. Uh, was taken alive. He ultimately he was and he was the only one that was taken alive. But he ultimately lived out his entire sentence. Uh, was transferred to, to um, Alcatraz. Lived out his entire sentence out there. Was paroled was deported to Canada, so he'd been born in Canada, and um, died in, in 1979 in Spain, where he had gone off and, and whatever reason chose Spain, um, and would, according to a lot of reports, sadly sat around the different bars and cafes and things, drinking wine and telling people what a tough guy he used to be. Oh. So it's kind of a sad, <laughs> sad ending for him, really. I mean, not that he was a person, but um, but kind of an interesting way for it to sort of come down. Um, his career began early, like many of his cohorts. Uh, by the age of 10, he was associating with bootleggers, pimps, and bank robbers. It was while he was serving time in Kansas, in the Kansas State Penitentiary in Lansing, Kansas, that he met Fred Barker, who was serving time for bank robbery. Uh, when he was released in 1931, he joined up with the gang. And um, they were basically, it was at that point that the Carpus Barker gang, which is how he liked it to be called because he swore he was the mastermind um, instead of the Barker Carpus, he wanted first billing. Uh, but the Carpus Barker gang became one of the most formidable, formidable criminal gangs of the 1930s. They did not hesitate to kill anyone who got in their way, even innocent bystanders. The gang, including Ma and her paramour, Arthur Dunlop, fled to St. Paul, Minnesota. The group was led by Alvin, according to him, who interestingly claimed and, and pretty well, I think it's pretty well proven over the years and during his time in Alcatraz, that he had a photographic memory and was described as super smart by fellow gang members. You got to kind of, you know, sort of the source. But um, the other leaders of the gang, of course, like I said, were Doc and Fred and, um, and about a, a crew of about 25. So, um, just after Ma and Fred's death in January of 1935, Carpus nearly met his own violent end when the Bureau located him in Atlantic City, New Jersey. He continued his crimes with others, but had to be on the move constantly because they really were closing in and, and things were not, um, not going well. Time was limited, basically. Um, but their biggest connection that we can really pinpoint uh, is on the Ramsey County side of town, side of the lake in Wiper Township, um, and they actually rented this cottage called Idlewild, it's still and it looks like this today. It was green and white when they had it in, in uh, 1933, but they rented it for the month of May, 1933. And ultimately it's believed that this was the place where they planned and plotted the Hams kidnapping. The idea was that um, basically they wanted a spot where they could drive into St. Paul each day, but they weren't in St. Paul, they weren't staying in St. Paul. They could drive into St. Paul each day and case the home of William Ham and learn his routine. Ham, of course, was one of those characters, one of those men who does everything that law enforcement tells you not to do. So in, in the sense of doing exactly the same routine every day, he got up at the same time, he left his house at the same time, walked to the office along the same route, walked home every day for lunch, walked back to the office, you know, all of that. So he was a fairly easy mark in that regard. Um, according to Carpus in one of his, his books, he said, we got to know so much about the guy that I was sick of him long before the kidnapping. <laughs> <laughs> but within the neighborhood, the gangsters, like I say, and like many of them used the cover that they were musicians in the plantation and um, would often stay up all night and, and run around. And of course, area residents love telling stories about the Barker Carpus gang in their midst. Interestingly, one of, one of the um, 
best parts about them and this location is a series of oral history interviews that were given by a, a man who's passed away now, but he was a neighbor. He lived across the street as a young boy from the um, cottage and actually lived his whole life in that house. He ended up buying it from his parents or whatever. But um, he went over and cut the grass for the gang um, at Idlewild Cottage. <laughs> and at that time, they were going under the alias of the Wilson family which is entertaining because the summer before they had been in a cottage in Delwood as the Hunter family. Um, and I'm sorry, but Delwood and Bald Eagle are not that far apart, <laughs> uh, but whatever. Uh, so ultimately, uh, Al Lindholm went over and cut the grass for Mrs. Wilson. And he said um, two of his favorite things were number one, she gave him an ice cold cream bottle of cream soda because it was a hot summer day or hot May day. Uh, and he, for the rest of his life, loved cream soda. That was his favorite. And she gave him five dollars. So he went home and, and showed his mom the five dollars and said, There's no way she meant to do that. That's wrong. That's way too much money in 1933. And um sent him back. And Mrs. Wilson said, Oh no, 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 take it. That's you know, that's for you. And so his mother was thrilled, <laughs> at least until the federal agents came a few days later. The the Wilsons had suddenly disappeared, and the federal agents came knocking on the doors of all the neighbors to find out what was going on. And told them, of course, exactly who they had had at their, in their neighborhood. And of course, Mrs. Um, Mrs. Lindholm was devastated that she had sent her young son over to hang out with a hardened <laughs> criminal. So um, <laughs> not so great, but it happens, I guess. Then, um, so anyway, uh, as I said, during the time that they were at Bald Eagle, it's it's pretty well understood that they were plotting the ham kidnapping. Interestingly. Uh, for as violent as the Barkers and Corpus, Corpus gang was, when they, they got into kidnapping toward the end, uh, and again, prohibition was being repealed, things were happening, uh, they had to sort of diversify, if you will, and um, they got into kidnapping, but they really weren't, they, they weren't intending to hurt the kidnapped victims, and they really didn't. I mean, they, they would take them, they would hide them, they would take care of them, if you will, they would feed them, whatever. And then they would get the money, bring them back. And so ultimately, um, Ham was kidnapped. They called for a ransom of $100,000. And it was paid, and he was brought home. When they kidnapped him, they took him out to uh, Illinois. They took him out of town, and for whatever reason, that was where they went um, most of the time. And ultimately, uh, one of my favorite, again, stories is that Ham reportedly said that uh, so during Prohibition, even during the height of Prohibition, a lot of the breweries would were allowed to either produce near beer, almost non-alcoholic beer, um, just very low alcohol, or root beer and, and soft drinks and other things. And so the Hams Brewery was very active and still happening, just not producing the hard stuff or the, the bigger stuff. And ultimately, um, he said that, Mr. Ham said that when they had him, when they were holding him, they would feed him and you know, make sandwiches and whatever, and usually give him a beer with his lunch. And at one point, apparently, they even apologized because it wasn't Ham's beer. They felt bad. <laughs> okay. Uh, you never know. That, and then as the story goes, and who knows, you know, again, if it's true, but as the story goes, he um, they asked him if he could tell, too. So it's always kind of entertaining from that standpoint. So, um, but Carpus truly, as I said, was, was really the... Um, He's the infamous one, if you will, or the most infamous of them all, because he was um, captured alive, was able to tell his story, be able to record all of these things, really like the notoriety. And uh, he was, if you've ever been to Landmark Center in downtown St. Paul, it was the federal courthouse. That's where he was tried. And they have a great exhibit within the building there of some of the pictures and things um, of him you know, being brought in and all of that. So kind of an entertaining piece. But um by this point, you can see actually his sort of progression over the years, uh, or at different times anyway. Um, he aged fairly heavily, which he would in prison, but um, kind of an interesting fella. I think, and this is just, I have zero authority to be able to determine this, other than just a lot of reading and, and learning about Carpus, but um, if I have to bet, have to bet I would say that he was probably somewhere on the spectrum 
I think he was probably autistic or, or something in that realm. Again, I have no medical background, but just talking about how smart he actually was and, and um, but he was very socially challenged and had a lot of quirks in that regard. Um, but as time went on, um, he, he did okay. So, um, but interestingly, and the Minneapolis Star is one of the one publishing this, so I think that's entertaining as well. As prohibition was being repealed and, and things were sort of coming to an end for a lot of the gangs, the community started to gather together as well. And so everybody around the lake, basically, this is one of the first collaborative efforts around the lake, which is kind of interesting, but they started to, to get together um, and essentially formed what is either referred to as the Vigilance Committee or the Vigilante Committee, depending on the publication or the information you look at. Um, but they started to come together as early as 1932 but by 1934, uh, the citizens of White Bear were righteously indignant. They um, formed the committee with the purpose to rid White Bear Township, Lincoln Township, which would merge eventually merge with Montemina, uh, Delwood, Montemina, and Birchwood of this class of undesirable summer residents, along with the city, those in the city of White Bear Lake. Uh, Don't let the sun set on you here is the notice given to all criminals by the newly formed committee. The plan originally outlined was to have every newcomer to the Lake District investigated uh, and to serve this notice on all persons who cannot show themselves honest citizens. Uh, representatives <laughs> from each community around the lake were elected to the committee and a, the, a plan was established to monitor all vacant, vacant dwellings, post notice signs on the doors of any of those dwellings, warning that if they were under surveillance, investigate and register all of the um, visitors. The committee was actually monitored as you see, or uh, modeled after one on Lake Minnetonka as well. Interestingly, um, they they got all active and involved, and then it faded very quickly because as prohibition was repealed, they were able to uh, really kind of move on. The other final element to things was the fact that as the Bureau of Investigation and the federal agents continued their work under J. Edgar Hoover and, and some of the others who were leading the charge, they really um, were able to get more organized. Mm -hmm. Technology was changing. So it was things like the fingerprinting technology, which was of course tedious and, and horrible compared to what it is today with, with computers, um, having to check, hand check thousands of fingerprints back and forth. Um, but it was actually fingerprint technology that re was really what got the Barker Corpus game, for example, initially. Um, and the fact that they were able to, under Hoover, they were able to form a federal organization that could work together you know instead of getting to you know the state line or whatever and not being able to pursue your the person you were chasing or the group you were chasing they were able to communicate together and, and work cohesively uh, and of course that was critical when they started getting into things like the kidnappings as time went on uh, so by the mid-30s things had settled down mostly there were lots of other challenges but um, prohibition fading and um a lot of the other things, and you know, obviously there's still criminal activity for sure, but the the level of the power of the gangsters really diminished drastically at that point. And again, a lot of them were gone. A lot of them, a lot of the higher levels were either killed or killed each other um, through the process. And then the middle and lower levels kind of went back, I and mean, they were farmers, they were merchants in town, they were whatever, and they went back to whatever they had been doing before all of this. So there were many, many people who, especially when, with prohibition toward the end of it, who got pulled into this whole world. So that's the, the end of the official presentation portion, but I'm happy to answer questions or as we love, um, listen, hear any stories that you might have to share or rumors and things about the area. Uh, anything anybody's come across as they've been talking about? <laughs> Another question about, so on the northern side of Bald Eagle Lake, there's, complex of cottages that just until I think last year were still in operation. Was that affiliated with? Were they the log cabin -y looking ones right in the shore there? Um, not that we know of, but it doesn't mean they didn't rent one or whatever at, at any points. Um, truly, it's it's really entertaining because we do hear all the time that, you know, oh, my grandmother rented to Dillinger or my, you know, my aunt uh, had Ma Barker for a neighbor or employed, you know, so-and-so employed us or whatever, you know, there, there were a lot of, a lot of folks talk about my dad was the chauffeur for so-and-so or the whatever, when they came to visit or delivered beer or whatever. Um, 
So a lot of, certainly a lot of possibilities. And, and like I said before, um, I bet I would imagine that many of those things happened. They weren't just necessarily, they were ne weren't necessarily Ma or Dillinger or kind of the, the lead guys or lead folks, but um, yeah, and, and tons of, it's always entertaining because we get calls all the time with, you know, we found these things behind the wall when we were <laughs> remodeling or whatever. We found these bottles or we found, you think it was a gangster hideout. And it's like, would have been, or just somebody who liked moonshine. <laughs> uh, hard to say, uh, but they're definitely, we're inhabiting all of the different spots, so. Would you remind, um, repeat every question as people oh, mentioned yes, for the Zoom yes, people? Yes, <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, and then so, so um, the question actually that I was just responding to um, that I don't really have anything specific about that site, but there, there are some cabins, some log cabin uh, sites on the northeast corner of Bald Eagle Lake that um, are of a certain age. I would say they probably fit that time period. Um, and they, uh, we don't know anything specific about them, but they very well could have been I think certainly have spots that they rented. So, all right. Well, interesting. So, Manitoba, when the housing was like out there, I was always told that that was kind of a homeless place. Can you say not? I would say not. Um, so, the, so the question is about Manitou Island in the middle of the lake, and that there's there are rumors that it was Capone's place to hang out and that sort of thing. Um, not likely. Uh, I, I would be surprised. The um, now again, would I ever say never? No, but um, Capone specifically, not likely. I don't even know. We really don't hear much a murmur about the gangsters even being out there. I think if if they were doing anything with the families that had summer homes on the island, it would probably have been in St. Paul, if that makes sense. Um, much like the Hams and the Bremers and some of the others that they were kidnapping later, they didn't, th those, that sort of social class didn't tend to associate a whole lot with the criminal element, mainly because they were the targets of the kidnapping and that type of thing. So, it, you know, um, but again, I wouldn't rule out anything. Um, you never know. So. Oh. All right. So, so just for the record, yeah. This is. Hey, do you need the microphone though? So you're gonna talk. Just repeat. Oh, sure. I've heard that over the years. Okay. Um. So, so Dan, who works with us at the Historical Society, and that's logical. It makes sense. Um, so one of the, his comment is that, um, you know, the, the island, of course, is an island. There's a bridge to get across. The gangsters didn't like only having one way to exit, which would make sense. I mean, they could potentially hop on a boat, but that's complicated. And, um, it's actually the same reason in some ways that the, the island is considered um, a, a prime maple sugar and prime sugar bush for the Dakota because it was protected. It was, you could see people coming from the water and the other directions and so it would be kind of a similar idea I think um yeah I just uh, the, I will say that the, there are lots of rumors about Bruce Willis hanging out on the island in the 1980s and those are accurate um, <laughs> he did have friends out there so there's that but uh, anyway yes just a very subjective comment you know thank you for all the photos of these people my my thought looking at those people's faces is every one of them, there was just such a innate sadness or, mm -hmm. except for one. And the one who to me had a tough, really tough look instead of sad, mm -hmm. it was the guy, machine gun. Oh, yeah. mm -hmm. But the pretty only one um, who I always thought, you know, these were, but there was just something very tragic and sad about their expression. Sure. Um, like, so tough, tough growing up. And, I, I I mean, I do think that in many ways you don't get to this, you know, lifestyle. Necessary. I mean, I, there's all sorts of reasons, of course, but, um, but so the, the comment was that from the, the pictures, the photos of all of these folks, that it was um, many of them, most of them look sad, that there's a, a sort of, you know, I, I don't know what how to really describe it. Um, my only response to that would be that they were mug shots, so they probably weren't thrilled at that moment, for most of them anyway. Um, but uh, the one, interestingly, that you picked up, Machine Gun Kelly, his whole sort of persona 
was a facade. So um, he was he was uh, a tough guy, and, and he was pushed very hard by his wife, Kit Kelly, and she's the one who called him machine gun, and she's the one who put his whole, like, you know, personality out there and tried to really push that. So it's interesting that you picked up that, you know, he kind of tried to look like a tough guy in his photo, but interesting. So I think there was... I thought when you had them all lined up, their, their eyes gave them away. They just have a real funny look in their eyes. All of them about the same. Yeah. So the comment is that the eyes kind of basically gave them away. And, um, you know, I don't know it's what scary. the science it's is, scary. but they, they were a little eerie, you know, all of them, for sure. Mm -hmm. uh, coming up from E, from, from East. You get into well before you get to Willow is the old uh road. What is it? The old Willany road at the uh it's no yeah, I'm Lincoln Town Road, I think is what you're thinking of as you go to, to the south. No, you mean, oh yeah, yeah, it goes yeah. to the south, but yeah. then it goes around. Yes. There's an old building. I don't know if they're talking about tearing it down, maybe they did already, but they I heard that used to be a speakeasy. Um, are you thinking of the lakeside uh club it was, it was a restaurant for many years yeah um it burned down actually if you're they have been talking about tearing it down for a long time but it burned down a few yeah. years ago mm -hmm. so the the question is about the lakeside um supper club or lakeside club is what they called it um it, it i don't know that it was a speakeasy exactly but it was and the silver slipper ended up this way too it was what was known as a bottle club for sure. So they had, um, you know, instead of buying the alcohol, they wouldn't have to have a liquor license, but you would go in, you'd bring in your bottle of vodka or gin or rum or whatever and leave it on the shelf with your name on it. And then you'd come in and buy the Coke or the sour or the whatever to mix it with. And they would sell you that, which they could legally without a liquor license, and then mix your alcohol into it. Um, and you had to, I think you had to have a membership, you had to pay some sort of membership dues or something to have the privilege to do that. But um, in more recent years, it was a restaurant, strictly a restaurant as far as I know, but um, but kind of a fun. And they played on it for sure because the downstairs sort of event space was called Al's Bunker. <laughs> um, so they definitely like to, to play up that element of it. But uh, well, I'll, I'll stop here and let everybody head out. If, if but if, certainly, if you have questions or things you want to share without sharing to the whole group or want to chat, we are definitely here. So, thank you all for coming up. <laughs>